In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulierbus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. In secular. In secular. This is Timothy Flanders, meaning of Catholic. Today we're joined by Mr. Kevin Simmons. Kevin, how you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. Bit early, <laughs> but but I'm uh, up and functioning. Yeah, this is the uh, the best time we could squeeze you into both of our schedules. So, Kevin Simmons is a Fatima scholar. He's written a book on the third part of the secret of Fatima. He also has a great book on the uh, the Saint Michael prayer with with Leo the Thirteenth, and he's done done great research over the years. This this book in particular is is, is um, endorsed by two prestigious authors I know of. One is Robert Festigi, prestigious scholar editor of De the recent Densger. He's been on this show, um, and also Joseph Shaw. Uh, over at the um, Latin Mass Society over in England. So this is a, an excellent text, and today we're going to be talking about disputed questions on Fatima. We're going to be trying to get at a general picture of where are the where are the disputed questions and where are the undisputed questions. So, Kevin, first, um, have I gotten all your books? You've got two books, the St. Michael... Any other writings you'd like to draw attention to the viewers with? Well, you got the St. Michael one, but also Refractions of Light. Refractions of Light. That was what? actually my first one. Oh, what's that? Tell us about that book. 201 Answers on Apparitions, Visions, and the Catholic Church. Uh, so it's, it's quasi-catechism-like way where it's mostly all Q&A, and then a set of documents in the back um, that were translated from the original languages um just basically talking about some of the fundamentals of the church's theology of private revelation uh what does the church teach on this matter what documents talk about it what um the one big document is the church's norms from 1978 that forms a good chunk of um of what, what's looked at as well but even some of the finer areas so questions like uh I went to X place of app alleged apparitions and I'm now a priest because of it so it must be true is that in fact the case? So those are the so some of the finer but also broader questions. Well, that's really good information to have a basic foundation because I think there's a lot of problems with the way just the common faithful may interact with these things. There's a lot of websites, as you know, which uh, purport to be X Y Z apparition, this and that, but are not necessarily approved uh, or even promoted properly. So. Uh, that mm -hmm. sounds like a very good text to get into. Uh, so regarding Fatima, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to first nail down what are the undisputed parts of Fatima. And then Kevin is going to talk about what are the disputed points about Fatima. And if we time, if we have time, we'll also get into some other aspects, if possible, God willing. So in terms of undisputed aspects of Fatima, as I understand it, Kevin, uh, the undisputed points seem to be, first of all, that there, there are very few people who really question the reality of Fatima. I think it seems that even among the so-called liberals in the Vatican, um, there's not a lot of people who question that even happened. Um, but so it seems to be undisputed that it did happen. That there was a miracle of the sun. It's an approved apparition. It seems to be one of the most approved, most universal modern apparitions. Um, in terms of belief in general. Um, but the, the basic message of Fatima of penance uh, during World War I, uh, that World War I is a punishment for sin, that uh, there first needs to be uh, penance regarding the Blessed Sacrament and the first apparitions with the angel. There needs to be an offering of suffering, an acceptance of suffering uh, in reparation for sinners to convert them. And the, the, the particular message because that's sort of still sort of a general message of general repentance that you can re read in the scriptures, of course. But the, the particular message of Fatima is basically trying to avert World War II. 
So God is punishing the world. We need to repent. We need to expect, especially the devotions to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the consecration of Russia. And all of this is basically we need to repent or else there will be a worse war. So it seems that that's the particular message of Fatima, which is more or less undisputed in terms of the basic facts of what happened and the message. So have I accurately described this, Kevin? What do you can you correct me where I've omitted anything or gotten anything wrong there? For the most part, I'm with you on your description. The I, I the one thing that really jumps out at me is when you're saying you put a little too much emphasis upon World War Two in the message of Fatima. Um, the message of Fatima, yes, Our Lady predicts that another and worse war will break out during the pontificate of, of Pius XI. That is true. But uh, it's it, it also goes a bit beyond that. It's not like everything kind of goes to World War II and then just halts. That kind of got that impression from how you were characterizing it. Um, because that actually then gets in other questions with respect to the third part of the secret of Fatima that we'll get into, I think, a little bit later. Um, Fatima encompasses a lot more. I think the, the, the onus that you, that you placed on World War II more properly belongs to the errors of Russia and the penance that is necessary and amending of our lives uh, that is necessary in the message of Fatima, I think, and the devotion to make the heart of Mary. I think that's better where that onus belongs. But otherwise, yes, generally speaking, your description seems to be pretty good. Okay, so can you tell me about more, can you elaborate then on what are the bigger points that are beyond World War II? Uh, I guess that gets into the third secret. But what, before we get into that, the any disputed questions of that, what are the undisputed aspects of where does Fatima go beyond World War II? Um, well, for instance, you know, Sister Lucia herself expressly stated with respect to the third part of the secret, she wrote down that this can only be opened in 1960. Um, well, 1960 was 15 years after the end of World War II. So what was what's going on here? Uh, so just right there, that kind of tells us that's a little time indicator right there that there's something that continues on a little bit more into the future. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm presently giving a series of webinars um, and I get into this a little more deeply towards the end of the webinars. So I don't want to, I don't want to play my hand, just <laughs> uh, reveal, you know, tip my hand a little too much, but um, yeah, I, I would, so I'll just simply say that there's that indication in the literature of Fatima with that date, famous date of 1960, um, so, which tells us that there's a, more going on past World War II. Uh, or at least just kind of indicates that. Now, in my book, I do mention that there are some questions about how we understand that, but that's one of the finer points that we can kind of maybe get into a little bit more. Um, but with respect to the, the, the finer point is, did it mean that events up to then or events subsequent to 1960 would be, you know, uh, have something to do with this? Um, yeah, but that's, that's a very, very specific question. <laughs> as opposed to the broader outlines that we're painting right now. Yeah, I, I forgot to, thank you for mentioning that. I forgot to mention that. So Kevin is doing a webinar on the 13th of every month, beginning last month on Our Lady of Fatima and continuing on the 13th of June today, or this month was on Reason and Theology. And I understand you're going, you're, are you going to continue all the webinars on Reason and Theology for the future? I believe so, yes. Okay, excellent. So. So Kevin is presenting a lot of his research that some of it's not actually been released by him on these webinars. So this is very exclusive content. So make sure to go and subscribe to Reason and Theology. Uh, in my opinion, one of the greatest YouTube channels on out there. So if you're not already subscribed to Reason and Theology, please go subscribe. Um, but it sounds like what you're saying is the undisputed aspect of Fatima, which goes beyond World War II and just reaches through really an indefinite period of time is the errors of Russia. The errors of Russia are kind of the, un everybody knows the errors of Russia are mentioned in the apparitions. Mm -hmm. It's undisputed. And that obviously goes beyond world war two. Um, yes. Very much so. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and I, and I know you, you reference in your book, how sister Lucia sent a letter to Pius the 12th and said that, the reason for 1960 was that she thought that communism would be at its climax or apex in 1960. 
So the yeah, she, she uses the Portuguese, uh, o ponto maximo, um, the, the high point, or as we would say in English, you know, the, it's zenith or, um, you know, it, it's, yeah. Um, but, she's, but she uses, she doesn't say that, she doesn't say in the year, ano, 1960. She uses uh, in the era, E-R-A, -E -R era in Portuguese, of the 60s. So we would simply say in English either the 60s or the decade of the 1960s. That's kind of how she words it. Okay. Um, well, I'm probably not using kind of how she puts it. <laughs> um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful letter that she wrote to His Holiness. But uh, And it was only a few months before he died, too. That was the funny. That was the kind of coincidental part of it. Um, so she was essentially saying to the Holy Father, we have not seen the last of communism. And when you go back and you do some of the studies, like what I did in chapter nine from my book on, on Fatima, you begin to see how this plays out a little bit more. And there was a particular insight that Cardinal Ottaviani had given in one of his own books that really helped me to see that connection and to ask some critical questions. So when you read that, when you read all of this in the night, but with the events of the uh, historical events of the 1960s, a lot starts coming into place. Um, and so I would encourage people to look at chapter nine for you know, more of the specifics on that. Yeah, I, this is, I recommend this book to everyone. It's a very excellent text with a great research and excellent sources. So you've really done a great job with that. And I understand there might be a second edition in the future. Any status? I hope so, that? yes. I've been, willing? Okay. Yes, I, I, I've gutted chapter eight. Um, so that chapter eight will be entirely new um, and it's pretty meaty too. It's not going to be a lightweight chapter either. Uh, and the present materials in chapter eight, I relegated to another chapter. I can't remember which chapter number <laughs> off the top of my head, but it's, I've relegated that information to that chapter so that more room can be made for this new chapter eight. Excellent. Okay. So well, let me ask you one last question about an undisputed aspect of it. And then we can get into all these disputed questions. Is the er are the errors of Russia understood as not only Soviet communism, but French communism, you know, American progressivism, various forms of the same sort of Marxism? Is that is there a more general view of the errors of Russia, or is it sort of just Soviet communism? That is one of the debates that's presently taking place among okay. Fatima um, aficionados is what exactly did Our Lady mean by the errors of Russia? Okay. Um, in my opinion, I certainly think it refers to communism, Marxism especially, but the underlying atheism and materialism are areas that I really tend to focus on. I don't claim that those exhaust what Our Lady meant. Let me be clear on that point. But I think that for us to understand present events, we really should focus a little bit on atheism and materialism. But again, not to the exclusion of other insights that other uh, scholars or researchers might uh, offer and contribute to the discussion. Okay. Um, yeah, it's very interesting because obviously Russia will spread her errors did happen with Soviet agents going all over the world and spreading mm -hmm. Marxism, of course, but also mm -hmm. there was sort of more indigenous homegrown Marxism of, of a different brand uh, in just sort of liberalism and various things that were able to fit a little bit with certain Marxist ideas, especially sexual revolutionary ideas. Mm -hmm. um, now there's an interesting point that you made, I think in your first webinar, which is where you pointed out that, the interpretation of the third part of the secret given by the Holy See in 2000 is a, the idea of the, the, the third secret. It, we're not going to go through the, the text. I'm sure, I hope our viewers are familiar with the actual text, but if you're not, you can look up the message of Fatima just on the CDF. It's all right there on the Vatican's website. <clears throat> there you go. So the, the idea of the Pope and bishops and, and martyrs being killed was a vision, a symbolic vision. This is the interpretation of the Holy See, as I understand it. It's a, it's a symbolic vision of the entire 20th century in which the heirs of Russia are killing souls 
especially in the symbolism of the arrows, um, but also killing bodies because they're also killing people physically as well. And then the attack on St. John Paul II is sort of just a culmination or sort of a, a one apex of that, um, as I understand it. So if I understood that interpretation properly in terms of the spread of Russia's errors? I th yeah, it seems like a fairly, fairly re good representation. The, um, that's a, a point. I'm glad you raised this. Thank you. It, it, we need to stress this because in that first webinar, I really, really tried to focus, uh, or in straight English, we'd say hammer. <laughs> um, I was really trying to emphasize this point about what exactly was the interpretation of the Holy See of the images of this vision. Because so many people have misunderstood what the Holy See has actually said. And I, I just quick re, just quick explanation. Part of the reason why people have misunderstood is because when this book was published, the message of Fatima with that has the, the text of the third part of the secret in it, um, which began on page 17, uh, right here. Um, a lot of people forgot, I guess might be the better word, or neglected, or however you want to put it, that there were actually two parts to the Vatican's presentation. This booklet was only one part. The other part was the questions and answers and the interventions um, that were given by Ratzinger, uh, Carcicia Bertone, and uh, Dr. Joaquin Navarro Valls, the Vatican spokes, uh, Holy See spokesman. And so when you look at the total picture painted between these two parts, we begin to start, we're, we're forced to ask questions about how people understood this. Um, and a lot of people really, I'm sorry to say it, but they really botched it. They began to focus exclusively on the figure of the bishop dressed in white, saying that uh, that this was John Paul's assassination attempt that was shot and killed and, and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, no, that's not quite how the Holy See said it. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger had a much bigger picture there. And he talked about it, as you said, uh, uh, very well. But it's it's a history of the of the tw what was going to happen in the 20th century overall. And it was he called the century of evil. And he he, he says it culminated, culminato, uh, I think it's the pronunciation in Italian, uh, culminated in the assassination attempt on John Paul II's life. He he did not say fulfilled. I think this, we have to draw, words mean something, and we have to draw a very sharp distinction here between fulfilled and culminated, because Ratzinger has already painted this picture of an entire century of evil that's going to have all these terrible things take place. But he says that the most striking aspect is what happens to the figure dressed in white. And so it's understandable why people focused in on that, kind of like zeroed in on it, but at the same time, there's a much larger interpretation, a broader picture that was painted that unfortunately was terribly neglected um, when people didn't have access to the questions and answers. And the reason why they didn't have access to the Q&A was because the Vatican didn't offer a transcript. <laughs> so when my book was published in 2017, uh, I was actually able to get a copy of the proceedings of the Q&A. I, we, we paid good money to have it transcribed from the Italian, and there was even some French thrown in, um, and then have it translated into English. So now my book was the first one to have that information. So now it's been restored. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll give you a, I'd like to give you an exclusive. So if people want to, you know, know this, they have to come to your channel. <laughs> um, there's a Portuguese journalist named Aura Miguel uh, she works for Radio Renascenza there in Portugal. She had covered, she'd been on over a hundred trips with the popes, uh, accredited journalist to the Holy See. She was present when this booklet was was published, and she asked a very good question uh, during the Q and A. And I caught up with her in Portugal back in 2016. 
<laughs> and uh, I had a copy of the draft of the book, at, of my book at the time, with me. And I remember I, I showed it. I was so happy to finally meet her. And I, I, I desperately wanted to talk to her. So we were able to conversate a little bit. And I remember she, she looked at the book and she kind of had a little, a little swift of her, like swift of her head. She, she, as she went, bent down. She was just, she went like this. And then she was reading the, she was reading the text and she was like, yep, that's it. She's like, and then she, she, she said to me, uh, she's like, that's one, I, I don't remember her precise words, but it was something to the effect of that's something that I always, that I, I, I always felt bad over was that the Vatican never released a transcript of that Q and A. So she was really happy that my book was going to bring that uh, to the public and restore that knowledge uh, to people's minds. Um, just wonderful, wonderful woman. So I, I had to tell that story. It's just thank it, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it, it adds color, you know. Yeah, this is just just so viewers understand. This is page three hundred and sixty four to five eighteen. So about one hundred and fifty pages of new primary sources translated for the first time into English that never been published before. So this is this is excellent. Thank you very much for providing this for everyone, um, Kevin. I think that's. So this is another aspect that's undisputed because we can just look up what the Holy See's interpretation is, especially now that we have this transcript. And mm -hmm. and it's interesting, as you've pointed out, Ratzinger was very big into eschatology. He did his habita uh, habitilita habilitation thesis on um, Bonaventure and uh, Joachim of Fior. And he had a big, long vision of Augustine and the city of God, very eschatological thinking. He's done that for decades. That's That's been his his M.O. So he's that's a much bigger eschatological, um, or at least in terms of not eschatological per se, obviously, because we're not necessarily talking about the end of the world here, but it's very eschatological in its um, depth of symbolism. Uh, mm -hmm. When you look at the third secret and you see it, and he sees it as the as you said, the, the culmination is merely the assassination attempt, but the whole vision is really the errors of Russia throughout the whole 20th century, killing souls and bodies. So that at least is a lot more rational now, um, because a lot of times it gets sort of straw manned, I think, by some uh, critics as saying, well, this is just, they're just saying this is an assassination attempt. It's only that. That's the only thing it's about. And it does seem a little bit less plausible at that point. Now, mm -hmm. Can you explain for viewers, and you, maybe you can go back to your first book you mentioned, what is the authority of the 2000, year 2000 Holy See interpretation? You mentioned in your first webinar that the Holy See sort of gave its interpretation, which is official, obviously, and is authoritative in some sense, because it's obviously the Holy See saying it, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. the Holy See sort of left room for other interpretations. Can you explain and break down how that works in terms of the faithful's obligation to consent to it? Mm -hmm. Well, the church does not enjoy the charism of, inf of infallibility with respect towards, with respect to private revelation, any, any of them, even Fatima. Um, now that has been somewhat discussed in the, in theological debates, but I do come down on that side of things. Actually, I, I do. I have concluded that the church does not enjoy that charism. Where the church's authority comes into place is with respect towards uh, disciplinary uh, matters, her, her disciplinary authority. It, the church has the task of ensuring good uh, faith and good morals throughout the churches. And so uh, the church, and in particular the person of her pastors, uh, the, the bishops and the pope, um, they have the, the, uh, the uh, use of the ficium, the, the right and duty to, or office, if you will, to ensure good, or, good order in the church. And if there's one thing that will upset the apple cart faster than anything, it's when someone says, God's talking to me. I'm receiving a private revelation. That will upset things very, very quickly. So the church, uh, or the pastors of the church are obliged to intervene when and where the matter warrants it. So when something is make, get, making headlines, let's say, uh, the, the local ordinary, the, the usually a diocesan bishop, has to inform himself immediately uh, of what the facts are and monitor it uh, 
for instance. And if it continues to grow, it may require his direct intervention or through his delegate. Um, so with respect to authority then, uh, it's largely the church's disciplinary authority that uh, gets bound up within these matters, ensuring good order in the churches. With respect to the uh, uh, level or the credence that we give to private revelations, um, the church famously makes a distinction between human faith and divine and Catholic faith. And this was elucidated very famously by Cardinal Lambertini in his famous treatise De Savorum Dei, uh, which a few years later he became elevated to the papacy as, uh, as Pope Benedict XIV. Um, and I guess there's some confusion about that lately because uh, uh, yeah, there's been, uh, there's been some confusion about that lately because the book, his treatise was written while he was a cardinal, but because he was elevated to the papacy, there's a problem with uh, some, there's a question of how do you, how do we cite this? Do we cite it as Lambertini or Benedict the 14th? Uh, I just kind of shake my head and I'm just like, oh, man, we got bigger fish to fry here. <laughs> um, but anyway, having said that, and I mean no disrespect to anybody. I'm just saying I think we have a bit of fish, bigger fish to fry. But Lambertini makes this distinction. I don't remember which book it was of the of De Savorum Dei when he makes this distinction, but he does make that distinction. And the, the, it's rooted in how um, the, what the difference is between the two. The theological virtue of, of faith, we believe God's revelation uh, on that divine Catholic faith. Whereas on the level of human faith, you know, if you tell me if, you know, if I loan you five dollars and you say you'll, you promise that you'll pay me back, I have reasonable hope and trust, dare I say faith, that what that what you say is true. Or if you tell me you, something that you saw on the news, I have reasonable human faith that you're not lying to me unless I have reason to believe otherwise. So that's kind of the general distinction. And the church says we believe or people are allowed to believe in uh uh, various private revelations that have been approved by the church on the level of human faith. We are not required to believe in it in order to be Catholics in good standing. And that includes Fatima. Uh, there have been some discussions about that, actually, but uh, I don't agree with those who hold the opinion that Fatima is a part of divine revelation, let's say, I, I and that we have to assent to Fatima. I, I don't agree with that position. And I, I mean that with all due respect, but uh, there's been some debates on that. So those are the general levels and the distinctions that are in play here. Yeah, I'm surprised that anyone would assert that it's a part of divine revelation. That would seem to be some sort of some sort of, some strange form of modernism adding to the deposit of faith. But that's that's just that well, no, it's not so much adding. And but the argument is that Fatima, they say, was predicted in divine revelation, and so when it happened, it was a fulfillment of one of the prophecies in divine revelation. So that's that's the argument that that I, I have seen advanced. Okay, I personally that's don't agree with it. At least, okay. Um, now, let's get into what are the disputed questions about Fatima. Um, as I understand it, as you already as you already pointed out, perhaps the first one we should discuss is the errors of Russia and what are they? Are they Soviet communism? Are they Marxism in general? Are they liberalism? Um, but besides that, the heirs of Russia, the other big disputed questions are the consecration of Russia. Did it happen on Pius the 12th? Did it happen on the John Paul II? Has it not happened at all? Um, and the third part of the secret, obviously, as you've dealt with a lot, which is the, has it been fully revealed in 2000 or not? Uh, you debated Christopher Ferrara a couple of years ago at an Angelus press conference in which you debated that very question of, and people can go and buy that debate, the audio online at Angelus press. I believe it's angelispress.com. Just search Christopher Ferrara, Kevin Simmons. So that there is the debate over that. And what are the other major disputed questions? Have I gotten most of them or are there other big ones that I'm missing there? Those tend to be some of the, the big ones, yeah. Um, others are kind of coming up and coming, I think, uh, just because because where the status Castellonis is right now with some of these issues. But the thing is, people don't really realize it. <laughs> That's that uh, some of these old questions 
are just that. They're old, they're answered, and the debates and discussions have moved on. Some people have, I'm sorry, but they have not caught on to that fact. So um, before we get into more specifics of these disputed questions, I wanted to ask you about Frère Michel's The Whole Truth About Fatima. As you mm -hmm. have coined, you have coined the phrase that that is the Bible on Fatima for a particular viewpoint that has particular viewpoints on these disputed questions. And so it seems that a lot of these disputed questions seem to at least trace some of their aspects back to Frère Michel. So you, can you tell us a little bit about this particular source and mm -hmm. what are the strengths and weaknesses of this source? Sure. Um, Frère Michel de la Sainte Trinité uh, was, a was a member of uh, Le Petit Frères de Sacré Cour uh, religious community, which was uh, part of another organization called Le Contre la Reforme Catholique, which was founded by a gentleman named uh, uh, the Abbe Georges de Nantes um, and, uh, in, in France. And um, it, as some of the history of Fatima began to progress into the 1980s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, the Abbe de Nantes had tasked uh, this member of, this, of the community, Frère Fr Michel, to do a, a study on Fatima and to publish his findings. Those that, that his research ter, uh, was published in three volumes uh, in French called Tout la vérité sur Fatima. Uh, the, uh, we would say the, the whole truth about Fatima in English. And in the mid 1980s, there was some cooperation between Frère Michel and I don't know if I'm allowed to say the organization, uh, but there was it, it's public knowledge, you know. It's yeah, he they he uh. Father Nicholas Gruner, a Canadian cleric, uh, had, had found an organization called the Fatima Center, and he uh, collaborated with Frère Michel, and they published Frère Michel's three volumes here. I have the three vol French volumes here. Make them stick out. These are the French ones. Fr Father Gruner and his group published the three uh, volumes in English, in which I have here on my shelf. Um, and these books have, as I say, usually in private conversation, now, now public, um, that they've become the Bible on Fatima for, for a, a certain group of people. And I, I remember coming across some criticism of Fred Michel back way, way many years ago, a friend of mine who lived in Fatima had noticed that there was some translation difficulties. Uh, Frère Michel, of course, writes in French, but not all of his sources were French, including Sister Lucia's memoirs and her, her, her other writings. She wrote port in Portuguese. And I remember my friend publishing an article wherein he pointed out that there were some criticisms of how that the French translation did not quite go with the with the original languages so i remembered that all for uh, for many many years oh, i think about 10 years at least and my friend has subsequently gone to god he died about five years ago um and i could i can't find the article where he talked about this but i just remembered the point so when i was researching for my book pope leo the 13th and the prayer to saint michael and i was discovering the fatima connection with that history um uh, I started developing, well, okay, how about we, you know, maybe the next book will be on Fatima. And then right around that time, the a biography on Sister Lucia was published by the Carmel of Coimbra. And that book really just shot ahead my own efforts to research more deeply with Fatima. Um, so the, and so long story short, taking my friend's insight with Fray Michel with the translation issues, I got the idea in my head, well, instead of taking Fray Michel at face value, how about we check his sources and see if everything pans out? So using that as my guiding light, uh, when I was researching some things, uh, with, you know, for, for when I was researching for my book on Fatima, I kept that in my mind not hypercritical, mind you. Not, I wasn't hypercritical, 
Um, there was various, there were various things that Fray Michel said that were that are very good, um, but I noticed that there were some finer points that I really had to scratch my head on, uh, and I was like, something's not jiving here, and something's not working too well. So as I dug and dug and dug, I said, well, you know, this is kind of one of the issues. I think there was a translation issue at one point. Um, that that was just one issue. But there were others as well. I can't remember everything off the top of my head. So what I discovered in a, in a nutshell was um, you kind of, as we say, you had to fact check, Fran Michel. Um, this is going to sound very terrible to say this, but one of the more disturbing facts that I discovered was Fray Michel was involved uh, in that in those, that organization that I mentioned, but the French bishops have actually view it as being a cult. They've labeled it as such. It's public knowledge. Um, they, they've referred to it as being a cult. And just recently, within the past year, year and a half or two years, the French bishops have actually given a theological, they made a statement about the some of the theology of the Abbe de Nantes, basically saying that he has some suspect, I think, Eucharistic theology, I think. Um, so I, I, now that's more to, uh, to, you know, to the man or to the character of, but I think that there's something there because even the Holy See had investigated the Abbe de Nantes. Uh, doctrinally, and the CDF, Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, has issued statements on him. Um, and I think that these facts kind of color Fatima a little bit, um, particularly in how uh, Frere Michel uh, attacks Father Edward Dani. He was a Jesuit who had some questions about Fatima and wrote about them very famously in the 1940s into the early 1950s. Well, I discovered that Father Dani was on the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's committee that was investigating the Abbe de Nantes. So I said, well, there you go. There's a bit of a conflict of interest right there. <laughs> um, but nobody really seemed to pick up on this because, again, the story is, you know, little humble Orthodox Abbe, Abbe fighting the big bad modernist, you know, uh, congregation for the doctrine of the faith, and I'm sitting here and I'm like, no, there are some serious problems here. Uh, Can you even give us an example of one theological issue that was pointed out or or warned about in George Denant or Fray Michel? Uh, off the top of my head, I'd have to. I honestly, I'm not able to do that. I can pull oh, up. No problem. Kind of a tangent. Maybe too. we can link it. I'd be happy okay. to maybe, maybe we could link that in the video notes so people can see your show notes, people can see it. It is in French. I don't believe it's been translated into English, but it is available in French. So the getting back to the source of whole truth about Fatima. So you're saying that there's certain translation issues um, on finer points. Can you give an example of source issues with Fray Michel's whole truth about Fatima? regarding any of the disputed questions about Fatima, any claims that he makes regarding Fatima, which are not the whole truth or erroneous or anything like that? Well, I talked about one of them in my book. Um, the main one that comes to my mind right now is the, and you kind of, we, you kind of referenced it earlier with respect to um, uh, Ratzinger and eschatology. Ratzinger in the mid-1980s gave an interview to the Italian journalist Vittorio Messori, and he made a comment about uh, that characterized the third part of The Secret of Fatima, which at that time had not been released, but Ratzinger had seen it. Um, he, he characterized it in terms of how uh, the dangers threatening the faith and the life of the Christian. Well, again, Ratzinger being involved heavily in eschatology um, he knows what this area is, and he's very competent in it theologically. But with Fray Michel, that original interview was, in, was conducted in Italian, or at least published in Italian, and it was translated into French. So one of the remarks that Ratzinger had made was he talked about the Novissimi, 
which is an eschatological term referring to the last things. But in eschatology, it can refer to the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, or the actual events at the end of time. It depends upon, really, context determines meaning. So um, it was translated, Novissimi was translated into Frère Michel's French text as Le Dernier Temps, the last times, not the last things, but the last times, which then restricts Ratzinger's understanding to what happened, you know, the events at the end of time. That's not necessarily what he was talking about. Not necessarily. When you so that was that that's one issue that comes to my mind off the top of my head because subsequent writers um, took that as a launching pad, if you will. And they, they, they were saying, this has nothing to do with the end of time, blah, blah, you know, all the, and it's like, well, yeah, that's because that's not what Ratzinger was talking about. He, it's novissimi, not the last times, you know, a slight difference there. Okay. Yeah, that, that is a slight difference, but has a ram massive ramifications as to the meaning of that. Okay, so mm -hmm. the... There are certain issues with Frère Michel not to be taken at face value, but as you said, there's still a lot, a great deal of good, good value in, in his research. Mm -hmm. um, what about the importance of using Sister Lucia's words herself? This would appear to be self-evident, but it does mm -hmm. not always appear to be self-evident. Can you speak to the use of Sister Lucia's source, I guess, if you can first break down what are what are the sources we have of Sister Lucia's own words? We've got the memoirs, we've got various letters collected, we have the biography that you just mentioned, which which brings out a, a lot of private diaries that were not previously available. That was in 2013, if I recall. Mm -hmm. um, so these are are there other sources of her words, and why is it important to use her own words? And to what degree do some people not even use her words? Well, I'm actually going to answer it in a very exclusive way because I don't really think I've ever answered the question quite like this, but for some reason it's striking me that I should do so now. The church was smart in the 1920s to have her, to, for when, they moved, when they moved Lucia from Fatima and ultimately she became a, a Dorothean religious and then later on a Carmelite. The church exercised great wisdom and prudence there because they protected her interior life and she didn't become this tragic, uh, you know, woman who had this beautiful experience and then just, you know, fell away later in life. So he, there, but there are pros and cons to this. She was more excluded from the world people were not as ready to, or to ask to answer her questions. So as far as people wanted to know the truth and the facts, that was, a, that was kind of a con, but it protected her interior life and allowed it to develop. That's a pro because now, even in death, remember our lady said, you must remain here, speaking to Lucia, you must remain here sometime longer in order to make me known and loved, you know, well, even in death, now Lucius, her mission continues because while she was alive, information was a bit restricted. People just couldn't walk into the Carmel of Coimbra and talk to her. But in death, all of her documents passed to the Carmel of Coimbra, or at least a good portion of the ones that they had there, and we can now study things a little more deeply this is a very profound moment that we are in right now. And I believe it's going to mark a lot of the Fatima studies from here on out because Lucia is kind of the prism through which we can understand Fatima a lot better, not to the exclusion of her sainted cousins, but she was the main interlocutor with our lady. She was the one who spoke to the lady and, uh, and heard her and, you know, and then throughout the rest of her life had different other various other uh, mystical experiences. So, Lucia's, because she was protected, she didn't go off the deep end like uh, 
other alleged mystics and visionaries have done over the years. Uh, and, and so she's much, she's much more, I don't want to say reserved, but she's much, uh, it adds to her credibility and her authority. When she says something about Fatima, it's very important. And this is all the more important now because the church has, has primarily been the interpreter of this. And that's the way it must be in the order of things. At the same time, we have a lot of good positives it, from Sister Lucia and how the church conducted her to protect her that we know what she says about Fatima is extremely important uh, because it's, I guess you could say in a word, it's very chaste. It's not going off the rails. Like she's not, she, she didn't lose her mind. So she's a very balanced individual. Um, and now that these writings are coming out, we're becoming more deeply aware of what's really going on here. And there's a lot of excellent work that needs to be done uh, in this area. Well, I, I call it Lucian studies. Um, I think it's going to shed an awful lot of light. I've been doing some of that work myself, and I'm, I'm bringing out some of it in my, my webinars. Um, but it, it's going to be it's going to be very impactful when a lot of these documents start passing to the public forum. I think it's going to be a huge, huge revelation. So what she says is important. You know, um, I think it's extremely important because some of the unique facets of her life and her character. Well, yeah, that's, that's very interesting to, to note that we are at a very crucial, critical moment in terms of Fatima research when we have these documents available for the first time. But the interesting thing that you mentioned in your book is that there has been a tension between the diocese of, was it Coimbra? Coimbra. Coimbra. The diocese of Coimbra in Portugal, which is where Sister Lucia was, there's a tension. There was a tension going back to at least in 1957 between the diocese and the general public or other, even another bishop. There was another bishop involved with this. Um, so... My question is, do, is there an issue with the use of Sister Lucia's words? Because in that, in that controversy in 57, they actually quoted Sister Lucia mm -hmm. in the dispute, but that also was not enough. And mm -hmm. so what are the, uh, would you say that there is, is a, lo a longstanding tradition of dismissing the words of Sister Lucia or not counting them as they should? Well, uh, let's see. It just depends upon where you start, what your vantage point is. If you approach it from what I call the hermeneutic of suspicion and conspiracy, you're going to be automatically distrustful of what people say Lucia said with respect to church authority, you know, ecclesiastical authorities. Um, and in the case that you're talking about, I believe you're referring to the Father Fuentes interview. Right. Okay. Um, Perhaps I should give some quick context for people on that. Um, Father Augustin Fuentes was the postulator, the vice postulator for the causes of Jacinta and Francisco Manto, um, the young visionaries from Fatima who had, who had passed away very early on. Um, and he was able to meet with Sister Lucia in December of 1957, I believe it was. Uh, sometime later, he then gave a conference to a group of nuns, I think, in Mexico. And he relayed some of the conversation that he had had with Sister Lucia and some of the things that she that he says that she said. But then he also published these remarks uh, in his own publication called, uh, and I forgive me if my pronunciation is horrible, I think it's Hacia Los Altares, um, uh, and which was his own, which was Fuentes' his own publication. He had a little like cottage industry going there. Um, he published this, these remarks attributing things to Sister Lucia. First published in Spanish, then it was published in English in the publication called Fatima Findings, a copy of which I have somewhere here in my files, um, by a Father Ryan uh, in Baltimore area, I think, or someone through there, Maryland. Um, well, that English translation was then translated into Portuguese by a publication called Avoge, 
And it went viral around Portugal. And it created such a brouhaha that the Diocese of Coimbra, where Sister Lucia lived at the time, someone went to her, and if I remember correctly, I think it was the bishop himself, went to Coimbra and asked her about this. Well, she saw the, she saw the, likely saw the Portuguese translation, which itself was based upon the English, which itself was based upon who knows what. Um, and she was like, I didn't say this. This isn't true. So the Diocese of Coimbra published a, 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 a warning, like a, a, a notification saying uh, that's Fuentes is not accurate here. This is not what. Uh, he's saying things that she that she's denying, and here's her exact statement. Uh, subsequent people have said that that statement was forced from her. It was applied out of her or something to that effect. There's no evidence to support that. Um, but it led to a big, big brouhaha, uh, which is continuing even to this day, uh, even in the chat room here that I see, because I have pulled up here for our podcast today. Um, so now having established the background, now let me be more specific. Um, far as anybody knows that statement that, that was published by the diocese of Coimbra in various publications in Portugal, um, it in fact was sister Lucia's words. I mean, she said this. So the question then becomes what happened here? How could father Fuentes one of the men deeply men deeply involved in Fatima as he was I think, the postulator, the vice postulator for the causes of, of, of Jacinto and Francisco Marto. How could he have goofed? How could he have flubbed up so badly that he essentially then becomes disgraced? Well, that's what chapter five of my book is all about. I look at the facts and I say, Here's how I think it all went down. Um, and to, to keep it simple, chapter five, um, a lot comes down to a very, very bad translation. Very, very bad translation of what was said. Um, I don't believe that whatever text got to Sister Lucia, I don't believe it was what Father Fuentes actually said in the original Spanish. So... Uh, there's, this is an area of Fatima's history that I only just broke ground on four years ago. Nobody has touched this with a 10 foot pole. I am the only one. And only, and all I did was just break the ground, you know, further research has to be done in like, say, for instance, the archives of Coimbra, uh, and to find out more of what happened at that time. Right. But as best as I can reconstruct the facts, it seems to me to be this a serious translation issue. Yeah. So once again, by Kevin's book, it's excellent. Um, but more to a more major issue than Fuentes controversy, the consecration of Russia under John Paul II, as you pointed out to me, Sister Lucia says in her own book, and I, you'll, you'll know the reference because I don't remember which reference this is, but Sister Lucia says in her own book that the consecration happened under John Paul II to avert a nuclear war. So mm -hmm. that's, those are her own words about the consecration. So it would seem that just uh, common sense might dictate that the matter is settled regarding the consecration. We've got Sister, Sister Lucia's own judgment on the matter. Is that why is that not enough? Well, because again, people who advance the hermeneutic of suspicion and conspiracy that I that I talk about, they've essentially cut people off from the sources. They have so downplayed them, they have so denigrated them that people do not trust the sources. And that is a grave mistake. It's a grave mistake. You know, Sister Lucia in her book, I mean, how many people even know how many people even know that there are videos of her on YouTube talking? She's on camera. She's talking. You can hear her own voice. How many people there's one published by Ecle uh, Agencia Ecclesia, I think it is. Uh, it's a Portuguese publication. 
it's there. It's the Bishop of Fatima notifying her in April, I think, of 2000 that the Pope was coming to Fatima to beatify Francisco and Jacinta Marto. They've got a whole video about this on camera. People can see it for themselves. People don't know about that stuff, though, because that doesn't fit the narrative. Because the narrative has been Sister Lucia was closeted away in the Carmela Coimbra. No one's allowed to talk to her. In fact, there's a fake Sister Lucy out there. I see a lot of people presently in, in the chat room talking about that. It's all nonsense. But this is what's happening. People have been cut off. And I'm going to say this very strongly. That is damnable. Damnable. Because when you cut yourself off from the sources, you get problems. And Sister Lucia herself published a book, wrote a book, while she was still alive, obviously, called Como Vejo a Mensagem, How I See the Message. Right. And what year is this? I was trying to find uh, the year I didn't see I it. I think she wrote it in, well, it was published in the shortly after her death. Um, and, but, and, just, and just for viewers, this is in English as How I See the Message in the Course yes. of Time and in the Light of Events, Sister Sister Lucia. So you can, yeah. you can find that English it's, translation. It's available, it's available in English under the Message of Fatima, which can be a little confusing because that's the same name as the, the, the Holy See's booklet. So it's a little confusing. But... Um, she she's writing this over a period of time, I think, and I want to say it was in the eighties. Um, yeah, so it, in the, I mean, they have an introduction. They tell you a little bit about it, but um, you know, it, it, nevertheless, it's it's Sister Lucia, and she says very explicitly uh, between pages what is it, fifty two to fifty four, Our Lady's words about consecrating Russia. She says. The word converted, this is Lucia's words, the word converted, which comes from the word conversion, means a change from bad to good. And that Our Lady's promise of peace refers to the wars provoked throughout the world on account of the errors emanating from Russia. Now, this is key, what she says here. This consecration was made publicly in Rome by the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, on 25th March, 1984, before the image of Our Lady of Fatima, which is venerated in the Chapel of the Apparitions in the Cova de Iria of Fatima, in which the Holy Father, etc., etc., etc. You know, and then she even says very dramatically in the next paragraph, everyone knows very well that that was one of the most critical moments in the history of humanity, back in 1984, she says, when the great powers, hostile to one another, were planning and preparing for a nuclear war which would destroy the world, if not entirely, to a considerable extent. And what chances of survival would there be for the part that would be left? I'm not in a position to argue, Sister Lucia. I mean, I'm not as well versed on matters of the questions of the consecration of Russia as I am, say, the third part of the secret of Fatima. But we have her imprint. There's video of her online, like on a camera, saying much the same of what she just said here and, and I just read in this book. So I don't know what else to say. I mean, I, I know a very respected Mariologist who I will not name. Uh, there's some, you know, uh, respectful difference between the scholar and I on this point, but, uh, you know, I, I, I can't argue with her words. You know, I do think we can understand them, uh, and kind of dig into that a little bit better, but I cannot argue this. She said these words. I mean, I just read it straight out of the book. So, you know, again, I, I can't dwell too much on the question of the consecration of Russia because I'm not as well versed, but, you know, again, these are the sources and we have to take them seriously. Yes, absolutely. That definitely taking the sources seriously, very important. Um, there's people asking about Christopher Farrar, just so everyone knows. As I said before, Kevin Simmons did debate Christopher Ferrara previously. You can look up the recording on there. Um, Christopher Ferrara is, I, I have a great deal of respect for Christopher Ferrara. I really love his book on America, which I referenced in my own book. Uh, tons of respect for Ferrara. And uh, I'm sure Mr. Simmons would also echo that respect. And they, so Mr. Simmons and Mr. Ferrara did have a, a respectful debate which you can look up. So 
Oh um, yeah, I, I've said publicly. I guess yes. I, I was interviewed by very, Captain very much respect too for uh, so absolutely. Um, so I, I'm trying to you know, all due respect to all parties that we've mentioned. We're trying to respectfully discuss everyone here, obviously. Um, but there's been unfortunately there's a lot of chat questions about the fake sister Lucia thesis, and you, as you've said, the reason this so essentially this is a bunch of this is a uh, the fake sister Lucia thesis is essentially a bunch of scientists or people or experts that were paid by an individual to do some sort of expert analysis, which this expert analysis said that there are two different sister Lucias. These two different pictures don't add up or whatever. But as as Kevin has pointed out more than once, I think recently, the problem with that is that all you need to do is talk to all the people who are still living, who are either her relatives or people who knew her and all they need to do is drum up a bunch of people who were asserting that there was a different sister Lucia. It's, it's not that difficult. I mean, how many people knew her in person who may be still living or have their writings or, I mean, that would be pretty easy to prove. Um, it's, it's a lot diff more difficult to, you know, you can pay a bunch of experts to make an expert opinion and that would be their opinion. Okay. I respect that, but, you're missing a big chunk of evidence and you, if you want to prove something like that. Kevin, if you want to respond to that. The only real way that people are able to prop up this damnable theory of the imposter sister Lucia, which by the way is presently in a much different form, a different form than what it is, than what it was even a few years ago. But uh, they have to prop it up by more conspiracies. You know, her right. niece just turned like 101 years old. She knew her aunt before her entrance to the Carmela Coimbra in 1948. Never once has the niece said, that wasn't my aunt. That's not her. Never. Nobody. William Thomas Walsh. No, I probably, no, I probably, not, not Walsh. Um, uh, oh, the gentleman who founded the Blue Army. Oh, my goodness. I'm drawing a blank on his name. I apologize. The gentleman who founded the Blue Army, he knew Lucia before and after her entrance to the Carmel. And he never said, that's not her. So, you know, it, it's people just, they don't understand the basic bio, biographical facts. You know, she had dental surgery. She, her teeth were rotting. It's described in some detail, actually, in the Carmelites' biography and uh, Sister Lucia. And she underwent a lot of pain with that. And that's why she had, she had dentures. And that does stuff to your facial structures after a while. And again, her her niece her niece is still alive. She just turned 101, if I remember correctly. And uh, the only way that you can get past this is to say, well, the niece was bought off, or she the mafia came after her, or something like that. I, I hear these outlandish theories, and that's the only thing that that people can do to prop it up. You just string along one conspiracy after another to prop it up. It, it's ridiculous. At what point do we go into tinfoil hat land here? You know. And it, it, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just total, total fraud. The, the recent iteration of this is pr the before 1957, the Fuentes interview and the after one, because she's saying things differently at the time of Vatican II. So let me be very clear. This is people that want to indict the Second Vatican Council. We'd be very, very clear on that point. This is not about Fatima. This is not about Lucia. This is people who want to indict the Second Vatican Council and all of the things that go with it. Now, are there questions we can have about the Second Vatican Council? You bet your you bet your next paycheck and a slice of pie at Eaton Park that you that you, you there are questions that could be asked there. But these are this is more about people wanting to indict the council than anything else, and they're just taking it out on Fatima. I, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, and, and I understand your your feelings on this, Kevin. And it's because you love Lucia and you love Fatima so much, and it's frustrating. And I understand your feelings here. I think that a, a question needs to be addressed because many people in the chat, I think, are misunderstanding what you mean when you criticize what you call a hermeneutic of suspicion and conspiracy. Because as I as I under when I re read most of much of your book. And as I talking to you, as I understand you, what you're trying to say there is not because as you as you said recently, the church has been infiltrated. You believe that to be the case. You believe there to be corruption. You believe there to be all this you know evil going on in the Vatican or elsewhere or where else. 
So you're not denying any of that. You're simply saying that the hermeneutic of suspicion and conspiracy is simply sort of a knee-jerk reaction that like anything a bishop says or anything Vatic the Vatican says, we have to immediately sort of go to worst case scenario immediately without any evidence, you know, uh, is that what you're trying to say there? Could you maybe distinguish, Kevin, because people are thinking that what you mean by that is we should just, you know, take carte blanche, everything the Vatican says, swallow at face value, no problem, that type of thing. What do you mean by that? What I mean by the suspicion, the hermeneutic of suspicion and conspiracy is when people, again, uh, they have this view of the church since about the time of the pontificate of Pope John the 23rd. And they view everything with this through a lens of suspicion and, uh, uh, and, uh, and that everything was all a conspiracy to, for the downfall of the church. Now, again, legitimate questions can be posed. So for instance, uh, John the 23rd and Ostpolitik. I think that was bad policy. So didn't Frère Michel. So didn't his associate, Frère François de Marie Desange. We are in agreement on the point. On, and with and the that's words, just for viewers, that's bad policy. That's you know? just for viewers, us politics is basically just going really easy on the, the communists, kind of trying to dialogue with the communists, working with yeah. the communists, something like that, versus the strong stance of people like Pius XI, just so our viewers understand what Kevin's talking about there. Sorry, go ahead. No, no exactly. I think that was bad policy. Now, I'm not, I, I, this is not said in disobedience. You know, this is a matter of policy. And I think John the 23rd, when he relaxed or actually reversed his immediate two predecessors' policy of not co non cooperation with communists, I think John the 23rd, that, that was a blunder of his papacy. Um, I think he did it with good reasons, with good intent, but I don't think he really truly understood the nature of how communists co opt people. So, I think that that led to some very, very, very bad policy. Did it affect the Second Vatican Council? I don't see evidence to say that it didn't. But to chalk everything up to we have to be suspicious of everything, regardless of the facts, no. Uh, it makes it a little harder because we, because it, because people don't feel as though they can just trust what the church says. What's that old saying? Trust, but verify. Uh, I happen to be a big proponent of that idea, actually. Well, that's what I did. I, you know, but I, 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 I reasonably trusted people, but I also wanted to go back and double check things, you know, to verify. So, you know, people that are advancing these ideas, you know, that they are, they're pointing out the splinter in people's eyes, but they're neglecting the beam in their own. And so it, it's a back and forth, but it's a both end. You know, it's a both end, a uh, both end. And so just because someone may have a correct point about some critiquing something with John the 23rd doesn't mean that they're right about everything else or that every all their conclusions are correct. You have to look at what the evidence says. But a lot of people with respect to Fatima, they don't do the homework. For instance, they take Fray Michel and they just take it as gospel truth. And there's no real critical thinking here. Or nowadays, they're taking other p other writers that uh, that we mentioned earlier uh, during today's podcast, and they take them as gospel truth. And I say, no, you you can't. You have to follow what the sources say. And you know, I know a big one that I think someone just even brought up here is. Um, you know, after Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano's Testimonianza in 2018, people truly believed that that now discredited Cardinal Bertone and Cardinal Sedano so much that now whatever they said about Fatima 20 years ago is, you know, we have, it's the proof. The proof is in the pudding, you know. If I'm not mistaken, I do believe that, isn't that a logical fallacy? I mean, my philosophy is a bit lacking, I guess, but, uh, you know, the after the fact, you know, uh, fallacy there. No, just because something happened and came out in 2018, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was some kind of a conspiracy to suppress the truth of, of Fatima 
by these same cardinals in the year 2000 or 2001, 2007. The facts don't, the facts don't go that way. The facts do not go that way. Um, and so right. you have to be careful to follow the facts. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's what I appreciate about your work. Kevin so much is that you are trying to get at the facts and look at the evidence. And this is what we need to do above all with Fatima, because we do our, our original sin, our, our fallen nature. It wants to take one Vatican official or one Pope or one Bishop and make them completely evil so that everything they did was evil and malicious. But in reality, very few people, even the most evil people, have some i just wrote in my book how uh what i can't remember what it was the cluniac oh yeah the the worst pornocracy pope john the 12th confirmed the diocese or the the cluniac reform which was the solution to the whole problem so i mean there's so many different instances of this you know individuals do good things they do do great good and great bad and many there's a spectrum of Mm -hmm. each individual so that's what I appreciate about your work, Kevin, is we really just need to look at the facts. We don't need to continue to always be 100% suspicious of every single individual automatically without evidence. Um, mm-hmm. I want to get to, here's a good question from JJ. How much of what Sister Lucia actually said was just her personal opinion versus what she was told by Mary? So you just mentioned the message of Fatima from Sister Lucia, where Sister Lucia said the consecration happened in 1980. Uh, what was it, 84? Um, so how do we distinguish that? What is the authority there? You know, actually, J.J. Ring brings up a really good question. Um, <laughs> this is a finer point in Fatima studies that unfortunately has not taken deep root yet. And it came up during, albeit maybe a bit lopsided because uh the debate time uh things got crunched there and the the moderator uh it kind of got real railroad and people couldn't quite get to everything that needed to be gotten to so maybe it came, didn't come out quite as well but uh when i debated with ferrara one of the things that i pointed out was uh the arguments that he and others advance are quickly becoming very outdated because they are deeply rooted in old information that doesn't take into consideration that we are, the documents are this ever increasing pool of knowledge of our, uh, and facts of what we know about Fatima, especially in, after Lucia's death. So um, the point here is We know that Lucia was circumspect about her mystical experiences. In my book, chapter four, I refer to it in terms of her being truthful yet evasive. And that's a key point in her life, in her in her spiritual life, in her character. Um there, and so we have to take this seriously. And she was very measured in her statements. So, for instance, chapter four of my book talks about the contradiction. Somebody in the chat earlier, um, somebody in the chat said, uh, please show something to the effect of, please show how the interior consistency of Fatima matches with the official narrative, okay? Well, that's a, that itself is a good question related to this one. Cardinal, well, then Archbishop Bertone talked to Sister Lucia and he asked her point blank, you know, why that met, why that year of 1960 on the date of the envelope? Was it Our Lady who fixed that date? Well, Lucia very, expl- very explicitly said to him, according to Bertoni's words, uh, she said, no, it wasn't Our Lady, it was I who fixed that date because I had this intuition that it would be better understood. Well, that flies right in the face of everything we've ever known. And that was one thing that is well, it was a legitimate question advanced by Christopher Ferrara and other people. Now, I said, I do honor here because this was a legitimate question, especially in 2007. Bertone went on an Italian television station called Porta a Porta. 
I, I actually have reproductions of uh, Lucia's letters with everything. He on camera, he takes the envelopes and he's pulling things out and he's showing people and you know doing this and, and then we get to Lucia's envelopes and it very expressly says, through the express order of Our Lady, this envelope can only be opened in 1960 by the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon or by the Bishop of Leria. He puts this on camera and damns his case, you know, because uh, he's like, uh, it's like, well, how could you see? But she very clearly stated it on in print, you know, and what is in print is objectively better evidence than his verbal relaying, uh, than his writing of what she told him verbally, right? right? The order of evidence. So Ferrara and others, myself included, correctly ask, you know, rightfully ask, how does that, are you trying to square the round, you know, bang the square peg into the round hole? You know, something not making sense here. He's right. Yeah. He's right. That's a good question. So chapter four of my book says, all right, Good question. Let's look at this. And basically, when you go through all the facts, I think her, that biographical fact of her life that she was circumspect, she was circumspect that uh, of regarding her mystical experiences. So in 1944, when Our Lady gave her that command, she didn't want to reveal that Our Lady had appeared to her. And Bertone did not ask her, did Our Lady appear to you, you know, and give you that date? So however she answered him, we don't have her exact words, and we don't have his exact words to her, because there's no audio or video of the recording. All we have is his later writing down in the booklet of what he says to her. Uh, so there's some room, some wiggle room there. Uh, as Ferrara himself pointed out to me, he is a professional lawyer. It's all in how you phrase the question. It's all in how you phrase the question. So however the question was phrased to her, however it was then translated by the Bishop of Fatima, Bishop Seraphim, to her into Portuguese. You see, you see what I'm doing here? You see what's happening here? A telephone game in a way. By the time it gets back to Bertone, through whatever channels, and I'm not trying to cast aspersions on anybody. I'm just saying these are the facts. We have reason to believe that, uh, or to question that, because Lucia was a subtle person, I think that what happened was uh, there was something lost in translation, as it were, and I think that uh, she, she only answered the specific question as she understood it without wanting to reveal Our Lady's exact apparition in 1944 and more of those details. So she answered truthfully, yet evasively. Um, and so it, it, all the specifics of how that works are in chapter four of my book. So, yeah. so I think it's possible to reconcile things when you look at it from that perspective. I, I even have an article about it on my website. Yeah, I, I think that's, to me, I, I think that's a very plausible explanation because it does show a very saintly character because there's a there's almost a shame. I don't know if you'd call it shame, but there's sort of an, an embarrassment. I remember reading, I think in the life of St. Anthony where um, they're embarrassed about, you know, if they're fasting or doing some holy practice that people might think are, is holy. They're embarrassed. Mm -hmm. They don't want to show people they're they're You know, they want to be totally hidden. So, you know, when, when a saint has an apparition, they want to hide it and, and be totally hidden. You know, when a saint has stigmata, they want to be totally hidden because they want yeah. to offer it to Jesus Christ alone and, and hate the praises of men. So this is a very saintly exactly. thing of men, of all saints to do. Now we, we've got about 10 more minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, look, just, 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 just real quick. I want to make a quick analogy. There was a movie made by Leonardo de Philippus about St. John of the cross. And there's a very poignant scene where John of the cross was in prison. He gets out. And he goes to, he takes, seeks refuge in St. Teresa of Avila's modest convent. Well, the authorities come knocking on her door and they say, you know, is Friar, is Friar John here? Teresa of Avila looks at the guy and says to him, Father, if you were to find a friar here, it would be a miracle. Did she lie? No. Did she tell the truth? Yes. And I, that's the kind of thing, I mean, truthful, 
yet evasive. Yeah, I, it's, that's it's, like an example. You know? It's basically like the the theory of mental reservation. Basically, you're not you're not. It, it's not entirely the same, but anyways, the the I wanted to get to a very important topic, which is far more spiritual and mm -hmm. uh, concrete to all the viewers, and that is the subject of effeminacy. We have discussed this on this channel many times. Me and Kennedy Hall, we promote the uh, Terror of Demons podcast and his book. So once again, effeminacy is a vice defined by St. Thomas as an attachment to pleasure, which causes one to be reluctant to suffer. So it's an attachment to pleasure resulting in a reluctance to suffer. So Kevin, what is the connection? All because all I know, as I mentioned to you, the only connection that I know is that when when Our Lady came to the Sears initially, they said she the very first thing she said was, "Do you wish to suffer for the reparation of sins?" In the midst of World War One, so there was already an invitation to overcome the effeminacy that was already gripping men, because men were deeply effeminate because they were spilling so much blood for money and power in a world war for nothing but economic interests. So. Can you tell us more about the connection between Fatima going against effeminacy? Yes. Um, that element of sacrifice is extremely important in the message of Fatima. As a matter of fact, it has everything to do with understanding properly the third part of the secret of Fatima. More on that in my, my uh, later webinars. Um, and I wanted to share with you some thoughts from Lucia's own hand with respect to... Um, what I think are some connections. Um, but the, I guess maybe just to kind of get it as I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to find it, but um, there was a time in the 1930s into the 40s where our Lord had talked to Lucia in private communications, again, private revelations, but, um, and I think this speak, this is a whole other podcast, by the way, it's a shame we only have about seven minutes to get into this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's, I don't know if you're able to go maybe a little over time, but I'm, yeah, I'm you can go over time. This is an important topic. I want to yeah. cover it. Go ahead. She says how this was a letter dated December 1st, 1940. Uh, and she's talking to a, one of her religious superiors. Uh, let's see. In spite of this, the hearts of our good Lord and our good heavenly mother are sad and grieved. Portugal, in its majority, does not correspond either to their graces or love. They frequently complain about the sinful life of the majority of the people, even of those who call themselves practical Catholics. But above all, they complain very much about the lukewarm, indifferent, and extremely comfortable life of the majority of the priests and members of religious congregations. The number of souls he meets through sacrifice and intimate life of love is extremely small and limited. These confidences lacerate my heart, mainly because I am one of those unfaithful souls. This is Lucia talking, by the way. Our Lord doesn't restrain himself in setting me there, showing me the mountain of my imperfections that I recognize with huge confusion. Nevertheless, our Lord goes on communicating with my soul. He seems confused about the destiny. I'm sorry, uh, concerned. Excuse me. He seems concerned about the destiny of some countries and wishes to save Portugal, but she is guilty too. If I mind you, this was around the time where she was writing about Portugal and the dogma of the faith. If I have not been mistaken, our Lord told me on Thursday at 11 p.m., quote, if the Portuguese government in union with all the bishops order penance and public prayers to be done on the streets and abolish the pagan festivities in these coming days of carnival, they would attract graces of peace over Portugal and over all Europe. Now, then again, a little bit later in one of her other letters, um, She's talking about what is asked of us in this time. She says, and I, I had it, I thought I had it marked out. Uh, I could have sworn that I had done. Oh, yeah, here it is. In a letter dated May 4th, 1943, she says, I had to make known to the Archbishop of Valladolid, by order of His Excellency, a little request of our Lord to the bishops of Spain and another to the bishops of Portugal. God uh, make all of them hear his voice. He wishes that the bishops of Spain unite themselves in a retreat and determine a reform in the people, clergy, and religious orders, some convents, and many members of others. Do you understand? 
He wishes that it be made clear to the souls that the true penance he now wants and requires consists of, first of all, the sacrifice that each one must make to fulfill his own religious and worldly duties. He promises the end of the war shortly in answer to the act of consecration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that point where she says the penance that God now wants or requires is that sacrifice he wants must bring in accordance with our worldly and even religious duties. That's been kind of the fruit of my own thinking. Uh, kind of like um, like I've been thinking about that. And when you look at what was going on there around 1943. There are some very, very interesting things. We see, for instance, World War II is still going on. But you're also seeing the rise of entertainment. Television, later on, video games. You know, people fall into sloth or sedia. And here we have our Lord presenting it saying, well, well you know, through, through Lucia saying, well, no, you know, uh, this sacrifice must be made. You know, you're gonna you're gonna be surrounded with all of these worldly pleasures, especially through entertainment, and that just kills the life of God in the soul because there's an underlying practical atheism. You know, it goes back to what we we're saying earlier about atheism and materialism. You know, you're not tending to your duties. So now our Lord is saying. No, like that's the, you. This is what's going to be. This is what's going to be a, 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 a flashpoint, a saving point in the future for my people. You know, is is this? And so I know largely you speak about the term. You know, things in terms of effeminacy. Um, oh, I've been on the receiving end of that. Let me tell you, people honestly believe that I am some kind of like demon incarnate. I've actually been called the spawn of Satan before. <laughs> because I question some of these things. And people, they have no idea. They have no idea where I've been, what's happened to me. and But I have been on the receiving end of an awful lot of that evil. And when I see what's going on and I see this beauty and the clarity of the gospel in Fatima, people ask, like, why are you so into Fatima, Kevin? Because it's a perfect summary of the gospel, a perfect reiteration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's so, and, and the things that our Lord and Our Lady pointed towards is meant to be this remedy. You know, I hear so many people griping and moaning and belly aching about what's going on in the church right now. Do you do the five first Saturdays? You know, do you fulfill your religious obligations? You know. Or are you one of these people that's living a cushy life, you know? And so, you know, I think it's important for us to talk about questions of, you know, what makes a man. You know, we can, we can talk about John Paul II's theology of the body, human love and the divine plan to the cows come home. But at the end of the day, who's actually stepping up and being a man? Who's stepping up and being a true woman? You know, it... it People have just got to, they've got to, they've got to walk the walk, stop talking about it, walk the blasted walk. Actions speak much louder than words. And as men, we are, this is what we're hardwired for. We are geared for action. Now, that's not to say that women can't be active or anything. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is men and women are different. We're created this way by God. We're meant to be mutually complementary in order to help and upbuild and, and encourage one another to be holy and mature men and women of God so that one day we can enjoy God in the Vizio Dei, the beatific vision in heaven. We're meant to help each other with mutual strengths, you know, and, 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 and uh, with our mutual strengths and, and good, you know, good points and our weaknesses will also, <laughs> will also re refine our, ourselves, you know? Um, but, you know, it, it we don't talk about these issues, and, and I, 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 I'm careful. I don't want to chalk up everything, you know, <laughs> to effeminacy, but it is a serious problem. And I think that's one of the reasons why you have, you know, such a good following, because people do see these things. They see what's going on. Um, and they're like, what's going on? Like, how do we respond to this? You know, how do we keep a level head? In the middle of all of this, you know, 
Some people do go overboard. So for instance, saying that it's changing the words and the, and the collect of the mass, you know, uh, in unitate spiritu sancti deus per omnia secos ecolorum, you know, changing that to saying from saying one God simply to God is actually more unfaithful with the Latin text. It's not unus deus, it's deus. And to say that changing that is modernist without qualification, without really any sort of explanation, that's, that's a problem. We can't just knock everything as modernist, uh, not because not everything is. Now, it is true. I think we have bigger fish to fry than changing the word of the collect at mass. Otherwise, it looks, it looks like we're just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, <laughs> that's how it looks. Um, but, uh, you know, again, are we really focused on the real issues? We focus on the real issues. Yeah, Kevin, this is this is an excellent way to conclude our conversation here. It makes me think of Dietrich von Hildebrand in Charitable Anathema. He says that the the valuing of unity over truth is at the heart of the crisis, because on the one hand, you you either have liberal or erroneous or heretical bishops, God forbid, whatever they are who don't believe in the real presence or, or not, or maybe they're Orthodox, but they're just not man enough to suffer for the faith and, and do the suffering that's necessary in the press or from his own priest to root out all the evil. So they're very valuing unity over truth and unity is comforting. There's a certain pleasure in unity. That's, that's, you know, cause you don't have to deal with all the suffering caused with causing a division Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that on the other hand, but on the, on, on, among the laity, we have this evil thing called Twitter and this evil thing called Facebook, which was intentionally designed to addict you to pleasures. It was intentional. They, the designers understand, they admit this, they, they designed that to addict you so that your serotonin levels get a kick when you get likes and retweets. So people are addicted to Twitter and social media, whatever. So they're just commenting and saying whatever they want to, running their mouths off, sinning against charity and endangering their internal souls because they get a pleasure out of likes and retweets. So they're slaves to all this. And so th this there's also this, this plague of effeminacy. And this this goes straight into what we're talking about because it just repeats, you know, whatever narrative that's sensational and emotional or whatever and gives you a bunch of likes and whatever that mm -hmm. feels really good so i want to share that on the internet or comment or detract someone detract my brother in christ uh calumniate my brother in christ on the internet because it's easy and you get likes or whatever this is a serious problem with serious spiritual ramifications that is carting off soul to hell as far as if, I'm concerned. if, if i may real quick uh, i know ahead. we're over time here but you know uh, I know Dr. Peter Kwasniewski personally. He and I are both oblates to um, the to the Monastero di San Benedetto in Norch, San Benedetto in, in Monte now uh, in Norcia, Italy. And he made a really good point the other day. Well, to me privately, and then he said something on Facebook a couple of weeks ago about how you know he's much more. I'll summarize. He was much more. He's more about content. He's not worried about the likes and the retweets and you know all the media gobbledygook that you have to go through for promotional stuff. He's like, no, I say what I say. I put my stuff out there. People like it or they don't. I think that's a very healthy way to look at it. You know, um, I, I really do like, I mean, I have my YouTube channel, you know, I, people come as they come. I hate, I hate promotion. I, I hate it with a passion, you know, but I do try to put nice things out there as much as I know how with, you know, I'm, I'm not a video producer, uh, but I, I'm more about con content. No problem. But how to produce it, uh, <laughs> that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, you know, but yeah, it, it, it's, you know, it, yeah, it, it's it's very prevalent. It is extremely prevalent. You know, I can't address everything in the chat room, but I know people talking about there were problems in the church. I don't mean to dismiss everything. when I When I talk about some of these things with Fatima, you know, I'm not saying all is well or right and rosy in the church or moonlight and roses. That's not what I'm saying. There are problems. But we have to understand those problems correctly in order to diagnose them correctly and fix the problems. Fatima gets abused in this regard. And so 
what I am trying to do is help people to understand better what Fatima is and thus what it is not. Because uh, otherwise, we're just using Fatima as a security blanket. And that's why so many people are so caught into this. Well, let me ask you something. If uh, all hail Pope Kevin the first, I, I'm elected Pope and I come out and say, oh, look, everybody, I looked at the Vatican archives. There really was a fourth secret of Fatima. Oh, and by the way, there's a fifth secret too. You know, all of you have indicated. What next? Are we so caught up in the fight that we don't have the larger game plan? You know, what next? You know, there's a picture famously of Napoleon. He was he, he had fought, fought all of his wars and he's sitting on his throne and he's just looking utterly dejected. What is there next to do? If you're not developing that interior life of virtue, maintaining communion with God and developing that and growing in holiness, what is this all about? Are you addicted to the fight for the fight's sake? I, what? I, I don't understand this. You know, that's not how men act, you know. So I uh, I just want to encourage people, you know, we, we need to understand things correctly. Going by half-truths or misunderstandings, honest or otherwise, you know, uh, it's not going to help us. It's not going to help us because if we get, if we, we're, we're, if we do, if, I grew up in the days where you, you did math with the long division. You got the piece of paper out. You had to show your work. Right? Mm -hmm. Now you pump, like speaking of doing things, now you're pumping in a calculator, you know. But no, I, I learned the hard way, the long division. If you do the math wrong, your answer is going to be wrong. No one wants to have the wrong answer. We don't want to have the right answer because we all love, we love the church. We love God. We love Our Lady. We want to save souls. We want to save our own souls. But if we do the math wrong, we're going to get the answer wrong, and that's not going to help us. So I want to encourage people. You know, I know people respectfully, hopefully they respectfully at least, disagree with me with, with, with certain things on Fatima. But hear what I'm really saying. What I'm saying is there's a better argument. I'm not trying to destroy things unnecessarily. What I'm saying is there's a better argument. So, for instance, the fourth secret of Fatima hypothesis, that there is something else that the Vatican is allegedly covering up. You know, well, we have Our Lady's words our, to the Sister Lucia. She tells her very explicitly, write what they command you, but not that which is given to you to understand of its meaning. So this question of the fourth secret is now over. It's done. We know that there was something else, but it could not possibly have been written down. Why? Because Our Lady said it. Said it. Don't write it down. So there is so that way of arguing it is wrong. What I'm doing now is I'm saying, is there a better way to discuss this to help us understand better what the what the, the meaning of the third part of the secret of Fatima is? I cover this in my webinar, or I'm going to be covering this in my webinars. I've already started. But that's what I'm saying. I'm saying there's a better way to argue this. And I'm going to be honest with you. If people go with what with what I'm proposing. Not even the Holy See is going to be able to argue this point. You'll have the upper hand. Not to saying that this you want to, you know, I'm not saying let's get the upper, you know, the upper hand over Rome or anything. I'm not, I'm not meaning it that way. I'm just simply saying you'll have the higher argument. If you pay attention to what I'm proposing and you see it for what it is, you're going to realize, oh, wait a minute. This is a better way to discuss this. And it's so good that not even the whole, even the Holy See, I believe, is going to have to, it will have to admit it. Um, because Lucia did drop hints in some of her writings, but she could not possibly have written down a document that says, Our Lady told me this, blah, 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 blah. She wouldn't do it because Our Lady told her not to. So unless somebody can demonstrate that Our Lady reversed her command in 1944 and gave her that permission, you know, it's it just, it's just, we have to rethink. This is what I'm saying. We, we got to get our math right to have the correct conclusion. And only then can we then go back and say, all right, now that we understand this better, you know, let, let's, let's talk charitably. Let's, let's go over these, these matters. And I think I've said, I've probably spoken way too much. 
<laughs> well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for sharing with your, your research. I think you hit on the, the main point is we need to be men of God, which requires charity and truth. And especially in that point, I definitely want to all, all respect to my friend, Peter Kwasniewski. He's been on the show a few times and um, I consider him a friend. So uh, we don't mean any disrespect at all to him. I, I love Kwasniewski and his work. And I definitely promote it. Also, Ferreira, Ferreira, um, especially his text on liberty, the God that failed, one of my favorite texts on the subject. So Ferreira does a lot of great work and lots of respect for him too. He's always well, welcome. On this well, show. I was agreeing. I was agreeing. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just I making this clear for the viewers because you know people take things out of context and whatnot. So, so um, just wanted to say that at the end of the show, and let's offer up a pot there, no stare for the intention of especially truth and charity that's that's been the goal of of covering fatima more on meaning of catholic is to just at least at the very least spread more charity regarding this issue because there's a lot of a lack of charity and if you do not he who loveth not knoweth not god for god is charity he who hates his brother is a murderer you will go to hell so you want to talk about fatima and hell if you don't have charity, you are going to hell. That's the definition of mortal sin. Mortal sin is the loss of charity in the soul. So it's very, very important that we have charity when we're discussing Fatima and we have a dispute like men where we can discuss things and dispute and disagree and whatever and go through, the, hammer out the evidence, but not throw a bunch of slanders and calumnies and this petty nonsense, which is unworthy of the name of Christian. So... Let's offer up an Our Father at the end, Pater Noster, for this intention, for truth and charity in Fatima. Nomine Patris, Fidi, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in cedis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adviniet regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Pater Noster, qui es in cedis, um, Panam Nostrum, quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, Sicut et nos demitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. In nomine Patris, Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is Amen. King. Amen.